Hey guys, Chris here for another Producers Cut, and today's episode comes from Season 2, and it's called Breaking from the Norm. And I chose this today because, as you'll hear in the intro, Felicia says, many of us were told, go to school, get your degree, get a job, go to grad school, get another degree, blah, 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 blah. You know, as if these had the key to give you a happy and fulfilled life. Why I think this episode might be timely is because, whereas this episode was breaking free sort of as a choice, I feel like the pandemic and... I don't know, things coming up politically. I don't know, there's been so much happening right now that has probably forced a lot of people to reevaluate what they were taught when they, as they were growing up. And it may be scary to try something new, but this may be an opportunity in this current environment as you've been shaken to reevaluate, to look at things from a different perspective. And I was hoping that maybe this episode would help out with that. All right, so... Without any further ado, here is Felicia's interview with Katrina McGee. Welcome to the Trill NBA show. I'm your host, the Trillist NBA you will ever know. And I'm here to help you survive and thrive in corporate America by giving the truth and being as real as only I can be. Today, we are talking about breaking from the norm. Many of us were told, Go to school, get your degree, get a good job, go get your master's, go make more money. As if these were the keys to a happy and fulfilled life. But what do you do when you did that and you find yourself stuck, unfulfilled, and just tolerating life? My guest today is someone I truly admire because she is absolutely creating the life she envisions for herself, and she is doing it unapologetically. Katrina McGee is many of us. She comes from humble beginnings, followed the sage advice of the elders, made everyone proud, got the MBA and the corporate job and salary, but still found herself restless and uninspired. Today, we talk with Katrina as she shares her story of how she created change for her life and is now fully conspiring with the universe to build a life inspired. Katrina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be with you today. I'm excited. I'm I'm excited that you could take out time from your busy, busy schedule to tell this story. And I think your story is so important because there's so many people who, you know, we did what we were supposed to do. Like, like me, I went to college. My mom was like, you're going to college. I went to college and then I went and got my MBA. And now I'm like, I don't want to be a brand manager, really. I don't think. I don't know. I don't know what I want. Um, But I know that what I'm doing right now isn't it. So tell me about your story, like where you came from and how you got to your point of I need to make a change and a huge change. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like, you know, it's a lot of the things you said, there were certain points in my life or certain points along the path that I was supposed to do. And it was kind of assumed in the beginning, right? I was going to go to a good school. But I think along that journey, uh, and I'll share more about that, but I think along that journey, I've been finding my own evolution with like what it means to be free. And I feel like where I got to today is sort of an ultimate expression of living a life that is authentic to me, right? Like getting off of the, getting away from the shows and off of the path that was super clear and everybody knows not the successful path and instead going my own way. So, um, you know, I grew up in a really small town in West Virginia and decided I was going to go pretty far away to undergrad. I went to Smith College in um, Western Massachusetts and, you know, not very many people from my school uh, went out of state, let alone far away, but I wanted to go to a good school and I wanted to get the good grades. And so I did those things, right? And I came from a family that didn't have a lot of money. Like we were middle class, but maybe like lower middle class. And I really just, I wanted the opportunity that money could bring you. I wanted to take a vacation. I wanted to travel. I wanted to do the things that I felt like other people around me were able to do or people on TV were able to do that I just didn't feel like I was able to do. So, you know, I went to school. I majored in math. I got my degree. 
And then I decided to enter, enter the corporate rat race, you know, like that's how you make some money. And right. so I actually became an actuary. So moved to Atlanta, got a job working at a consulting firm as an actuary in healthcare. And I had no idea what that was. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I had a math major and I knew they were going to pay me really well. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to go be an actuary. And I moved to Atlanta. And in some ways, it was magical because I really wanted to be in Atlanta. And I found a job that paid me like $45,000 when I was 21 years old. And I was making more than like my parents were making at that time. And it was like, wow, this feels amazing. Right. It really was amazing until it wasn't amazing, right? Like, right. we've all been there. It's that moment where you're like, this is amazing. This is going to be great. And maybe some of it is great. But then but then there are other things, right? And when you look at the other things, you're like, oh, maybe this is not my forever stop. And so I kind of knew really early on, like, I'm an introvert, but I'm pretty extroverted in my tendencies. And, you know, being an actuary is like a really, can be a really quiet job. And it's very like in front of your computer, number crunching. And like, I love people. I love interacting with people. And so I kind of knew I was like a square peg in a round hole there. Um, but it was a really good job and people did not leave that really good job with great benefits, great pay and great job security. So it took me a long time to really leave that field behind. I hopped over to a couple of different companies, but always doing something somewhat similar. Um, and then I finally decided to run away to business school. So I actually never thought I was going to go to business school. But when I was feeling trapped after eight years of working as an actuary and I was like, how did somebody give up a good salary and a good job, quote unquote, to like do something else, like what, when they don't know what that something else is. And I had a friend just say, you should look into business school. And for me, going to business school was like 95% about having the ability to travel abroad, to make new friends, to like broaden my perspective, to do things that I didn't normally do and put myself way far outside of like the norm in my life, like to break the norm in a way for me. Um, and then it was a little bit about, this is a really predictable, safe way to find another job that's going to pay me good money, right? Like nothing right. is guaranteed, but it's, you know, it's a pretty open avenue to leading to future jobs. So I'll change my life. I'll change my job and it'll all be amazing. And I won't have to risk losing any salary. So I went to business school. So I went to USC Capitol Hill. Which is a top business school. Yeah, yes. And so that was one of the things too, right? Like I had my little checklist and it was like, top 20 business school, I want to go somewhere great. Like, I thought I was setting up this better path for myself based on, like, what everybody else thought was a better path. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm doing the things, right? I'm checking off all of the little boxes on the, have a successful life to do this. And so, you know, I moved to Minnesota, started working in market research, and it was a job that a lot of people would have been grateful for. I mean, I was grateful for, for receiving that job and for the opportunities that it presented. But this was like corporate rat race 2.0 for me personally, because it was like, if I thought actuarial science and consulting and healthcare were like really sort of that corporate culture, you know, going to a company that is very marketing heavy and marketing focused, it was this whole other world for me. And it felt like corporate to the next degree as far as like navigating the politics and understanding that you are going to be rated against your peers. And like, you're going to have really balanced feedback where if they tell you that you did something well, they're going to have to tell you that you did something crappy because like, Lord knows we don't need you getting a big head and thinking that like, there's nothing for you to change. And it was like, Oh my God, what have I done? Right. Like right. I was like, it was terrible. And so for me, probably like three months in, I was like, I don't know if I, if this is me, but maybe I'm really new and maybe I just need to give it more time. And I am grateful to have this job. And like, everybody says it's a great job. So like, it must be a great job. Eight months in, <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. It's not normal that I'm crying in my car on the way home. Like, it's not normal that I'm crying and I'm kind of thinking, like, if I got in a car accident, like a mild car accident, I could go to the hospital and, like, just, like, chill out for, like, two weeks and my job couldn't touch me. Like, no one could ask me for anything. Like, I could just read some magazines and, like, be still and have a life for, like, two weeks. I mean, that is not healthy thinking, but, like, that is where – my mind was going because I just, I was in this place where it was like people wanted so much from me that I couldn't give because it wasn't what I wanted to be giving, right? Right.
That's it's key. Can, can you focus? I wanted to focus on that for a minute. Like people are asking you to give things, give of yourself, your time, your energy, your personal resource, and you you don't want to give it. That That's a sign. It's a sign, but sometimes we like just it, right? Like we are like, shut up inner voice like you go back to the corner you play nice and like stay over there don't make my life hard don't make it complicated but like we know I mean there's that feeling of like this is not working and it's so funny Felicia because I was just looking through so I'm in the midst of like packing up my stuff and getting rid of some things and I went through this folder where I had all of my old corporate performance reviews and I was just looking at this last night really it was like yes and it, why do I still have these things I don't know and so I was like going through the folder and it is so telling because when I picked up the performance review, each time I would go to read it, I found myself involuntarily like constricting and like taking a breath and like bracing myself for like the really like quote unquote balanced feedback where it was like, yeah, yeah, you do this well, but like we need you to do more of this. And to, and to your point, a lot of what people were asking of me in the, in the performance reviews were like, you do exactly what we ask you to, but you don't really go beyond. We want you to like stretch yourself even further and be more strategic and think even bigger and take on even more things and be even more of an asset to your team. And it's like, oh my God, that I can't because I hate it. Like I can't, I can't. I give you everything I have to give and that is it. Please stop taking more, you know? Right. Wow. So That's, cool. people are going to resonate with that because I think so many of us feel like that, like you doing I'm, I'm doing the very best that I can with you company. And you're saying it's still not enough. And it's like, well, when is enough enough? Right. So we trick ourselves because here's the way that they sort of like, I think sort of that the, the culture in general of working in like a bigger company, like I think we trick ourselves because they sort of make us think it's us, right? Or we even internalize that it's us. So if I'm not getting a perfect review, if people aren't like falling over themselves to tell me how wonderful I am, there must be something wrong with me. I just need to do more. I need to try harder. I need to like work longer hours. I need to be more strategic in like how I'm navigating the culture. I need to find a better mentor. Like it's all the things that we think we need to fix but with the assumption that we're exactly where we're supposed to be and we're just not enough. We're just not doing enough. And it's like, that's the assumption. So how do I fix this? Instead of taking a step back to say, like, is this even the right place for me? You know? Tell us about that moment, that day you were sitting at your desk or crying in your car or... Like, what was that moment where you said enough is enough? Yeah, so mine was a really slow build where it was like, it kept happening every day. Like every day there was a little tiny like piece of me that was like, it would just say no. It wasn't complicated, it was super simple, but it was like, no. And it was like when somebody would ask me to do something, like it was just, this, I wanted to just scream no. When somebody wanted like me to go above and beyond or when someone would send me an email, just asking me a question. Like sometimes I would just be like, no. And it was like all of these no's. And I remember feeling like I was ripping in half. Like I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know how to be happy. I didn't think there was anything else in this whole wide world that I could do for a living, which is just insane because that's so not true. But it was like, I can't do anything else and stuff. I could never live with less money. Like if I go find happiness, that automatically means I'm going to be poor. And like, really, what else is there to work in a nonprofit? Like I just was so stuck in it. But the one thing I knew is that I couldn't do it by myself. And so I just started sharing my truth with people I trusted and like trying to get somebody somewhere that understood me, that saw me, that could tell me like how I could help myself. And that person came in the form of a contract worker who sat in my aisle and was super awesome. And we just started talking one day and I told her how I really felt like I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I don't know what to do about it. And she was like, I have a friend who's a really great life coach. And she was like, I can give you her name and number. If you're interested, I was like, oh my God, thank you. Like I will take any support that I could get. And that just felt right. And so that night I went home and like looked at her website, really felt like, you know, I liked her energy. I liked what she was saying. It really resonated with me. And so within the next week, I had already like had an appointment, like my very first appointment to sort of feel each other out. And like, I signed up, I was in, I was like, I can't do this by myself. 
this is the person that I think can help me figure it out. It's hard for Black women, right, to ask for help. So how did yeah. you, to me, what I'm hearing is it was so bad that I was like, I'm just going to ask for help now. <laughs> yes, you know, it was like, for me, I was a creative kid growing up. Like, I played the flute. I played the piano. I was a majorette. I loved to tour. Like, I did random stuff. And I was like, really good at some of it and just okay at, at other things. But I always felt like I was going to do something really important. Like, I felt like I was important. And years of corporate, like, it wasn't just that job, but, like, years of corporate and years of doing something that I was definitely not put on this earth to do forever, like, left me feeling like there is nothing special about me. Like, I feel like it's in there somewhere, but it has not come out in years. I don't know if it's still there. I feel like crap. I feel bad. Like, I just don't even know what the hell this is. But, like, at this point, I'm in my early 30s, and I have a lot of years left to, like, figure shit out and to work, right? To, like, make it work. And I just could not do it. Like, I felt so stuck. And so, for me, it was, like, that point of desperation where I saw my life, and it was, like, more than, like, not wanting to, like, ask for help or admit that, like, you know, I can't do this by myself or that something is wrong with me or whatever, like, it was, like, when I really pictured the next 30 years of my life, I didn't want to live it. Like, it was just, like, I can't do that. That is, like, the worst-case scenario. So, like, I have to do something else, you know? It, but it's so hard because you're, like, I have this MBA. I have these student loans. I've put all this time and effort. I have now years of this experience that's very specialized. And it's just like, oh my God, trying to explain my transferable skills and then not even knowing, explain it to who, for what job and for what money. All those questions right. swirl in your head. Right. And you get stuck I know. in that. It's so true, but it's all sunk cost, right? Like we all learned about that in business school and it's like, those are real. But mm -hmm. at this point, all you have now is the present moment and hopefully a future. Like the past doesn't really exist anymore. And it's like we get wrapped up in all of the things that we put into getting to this moment. But like is living the next 30 years of your life being really miserable, trying to make that those past like two or three years and, and some of that debt like worth it? Is that worth your whole life? You know what I mean? Like it's like we can't like let go because then it's like that feels like failure. But really the biggest failure is holding on to some crap that's not serving you for like 20 more years than you should because you just need it to be a certain way. Like if it isn't this way, then it's a failure and it's not worth it when really like you're not living your life right now. You're like living in the past and you're not even happy. So how did you let go of those societal expectations? Bit by bit. So I'm a huge believer in courage is a muscle. And the more you flex it, the easier it is to be brave, to make brave choices. And I'm all about being unconventional because I think that a lot of times convention is really just like some collective group idea of what good or successful is. And like unconventional is like, I create, like it's unconventional because not a lot of people do it. Therefore, if I really want it, it must be like from some place deep inside of me that is like really, truly aligned with me. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, for me, it's just such, it's been such a journey to get there, but like letting go for me has been showing up at the life coach's like office and having that conversation and owning my truth, right? Like that's part of it is like when you say it out loud and when you say it to someone else, it becomes harder to shove it down inside because you kind of let the genie out of the bottle. Like you, you've admitted it and then it's like more empowering to like live in truth than it is to like keep telling yourself lie and so like that's a piece of letting go and also having little wins so when I was working as a coach I was doing things that you know felt scary or unsure or just different and every time I would do them I would get a little bit more brave but it also kind of opened my mind to see the way that I saw the world is not necessarily the only way to see the world and there are a lot more kind and loving ways to see myself and my future and it was like, it just started building, you know what I mean? And at mm -hmm. some point, if you want happiness, you cannot hold on to misery and like grab happiness at the same time. Like you have to let one of them go. You need both hands. That was a word. You have to let go of misery. 
so that you can grab onto happiness. Mm-hmm. Wow. I don't know if this is really for the podcast or for me right now, but I'm a, you know, I'm just going to take it all in. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so tell us about what do you think was the most impactful advice or encouragement that the life coach gave you that was that final push for you to leave the big CPG conglomerate that gave you the big checks? Yeah. So, you know, like the real life purpose of a life coach is basically unlock things that are inside of you. Right. So there's nothing she's going to tell me or she's not really going to give me like very strict advice. She's going to ask me a lot of questions, guide me, give me some like homework and activities, but like I have to unlock my truth and like what I know. And she helps me pull it out of myself so that like I can see it. Right. Mm -hmm. And for me, that moment, like that lightning bolt moment, when I went to her in the beginning, I was all about, Oh my God, please just tell me my purpose. Please just tell me, like, I don't even know what I'm passionate about. I don't even have hobbies anymore. I don't even know who I am or what I like to do for fun. Like I don't even have fun. I just, vacation and like work and then I vacation to escape from work and then I work a whole lot more and like I don't even have any hobbies and so in the beginning I thought I'll solve all of my problems by finding a purpose and she'll tell me my purpose and then I'll go off and magically like work at that job forever and I'll just be so happy and I'll make money and like everything will just be sunshine and rainbows right (laughs) but it wasn't that it's like totally was not that in fact I was sitting on her couch We've been working together for several months. Like I was really in it and I was sitting on our couch and we were just talking about something unrelated. And all of a sudden it was like this voice inside of me, like just said to me, you don't need another job. You need a break, like a freaking break, like a real long, long break. And I was like, Oh my God, where did this come from? This can't be right. Like that sounds crazy. Who am I to think I could take a break? I'll ruin my life. I'll never get another job. How would I afford this? Like so many things, right? But for me, it was like she allowed me the space to like really let what was inside of me, what had been bubbling up inside of me for probably years come out. And when it came out, I realized I was trying to find another job right away because like I'm responsible and like who the heck leaves a good job to go like do nothing. Like everybody knows you leave a good job for a better job. And that's the only time you ever leave a job. Right. And it's right. like, that's what I was thinking. So I had to find a replacement. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, my truth is I just want to be done. I want to travel around the world. I want to go see my family. I want to do all of the things I never get to have time to do because I'm too busy working a job. I don't even like. And so for me, it was like, that was my moment where it all just came rushing out. And then once it was out, like I said, I couldn't put it back in and it was like, okay, I guess I have to figure out now how to take a break because that's all I really want. So the funny thing is, you know, it's a small world and you and I are both consortium fellows. So what year did you graduate from business school? 2010. Okay. Yeah. We graduated the same year. So we were in the same class. So the funny thing is I had some of my friends that were working at General Mills when you were there and everybody is struggling with this. There are so many of us that are struggling with, is this the right thing for me? And so one thing, I don't know if you know this, but you inspired a lot of people because you shared with people like, you know, in the circles, like, hey, girls. Oh, my God. I did not know that. I'm leaving. Like I'm on, I'm about to be out. Like I'm I got a plan. <laughs> I'm saving up my money. I'm working this out. I'm about to peace out. <laughs> yeah, that's and, hilarious. No, I did not know that. Yeah. So I had actually heard about you preparing now high level, but what was that like? Because I know you decided to share with some people that yeah. you were gonna take this hiatus and go travel the world. And people, I don't know if you know this, but there were a lot of people that were really excited for you. That's awesome. So this is like, this goes back to that, like owning your truth thing. So for me, that preparation, a huge part of it was like, once I said it to my life coach and kind of blurted it out, and then I said it like back to myself, and then I like said it to my mom, like I just couldn't stop. Like at some point I got so excited because I know I'm supposed to do this. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm supposed to do this. Like, I just started telling people and it really was not for me like this dirty secret. It was like this, like, I'm a little scared, but oh my gosh, let me tell you what I'm doing. And 
I gave eight notice, eight, eight notice, eight months notice at my job that I was leaving because like it was so intense for me, this desire to go do the thing. And I wanted to like leave on good terms because I appreciated, you know, like that they had given me this place, but I did not want to pretend to like rotate somewhere else or have another IDP or make another five-year plan. So like, I was like, I'm just going to tell them like eight months before I go that I'm going because I have to tell someone. But for me, I would say 99% of the people I would tell were really excited because either A, some part of them wanted something similar or B, just having someone in your life say, I have this really exciting purpose. I'm lit up. I'm so excited. And I'm going to go like be scared and brave and do my thing. Like, how do you not be touched by that or excited by that or like even happy for that person unless you're wallowing in misery and then maybe you're like, jealous or angry or like maybe they're triggering some thoughts for you because you have this limiting belief that like that's not really possible or no one does that but like 99% of the people were so happy for me whether it was because you know they were like oh my god I wish I could do that or they were just like wow go you I love that you are so excited about what you're doing and so I had people like buy me dinner ask me questions put me in touch with other people that had like done some extensive traveling or taken a break of some sort so that I could like ask them questions I mean, it was amazing. And I'm all about like owning your truth and and telling people because I think that's how you get a really high level of support and also like hold yourself accountable for what you want. When you say, I don't know, it just seems like owning your truth can be so vulnerable. So did you, you, yeah. So did you ever run into anybody that was just, you know, get it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But like, again, it was like 1%. And I will tell you, it was like, I mean, there was a member, I won't call the person out, but like, there were like one or two people in my family, actually, it wasn't my mom or my dad, but like one or two people in my family who had done the corporate job for decades, and like, really did not love it, but like did it because they were checking off their boxes, right? And that's, that's their choice. But they could not comprehend what I was doing. And it was it was all about like, you're, okay, fine. You're going to do this thing. How are you going to live? How are you going to survive without like an income for a year? Like, how are you going to find another job? What if no one wants to hire you? What if the economy crashes while you're gone? And then like, you are basically obsolete and like, no one wants to like even touch you because you're this person that just goes floating around to take a break, you know, like, but I feel like all of that stuff. And again, like 1%, but like of the 1% of people that couldn't find that happy place for me right away and that we're like not getting it pushing back asking like questions in a way that were maybe leading towards like is this really a good idea Katrina I felt like it really came from um this place of like they have their own limiting beliefs about what normal is and what is acceptable and so if you don't love your job but you've worked at it for let's say like 30 years and it kind of makes you miserable sometimes and you kind of don't love it there's some thought you have and you've been thinking that keeps you there because your whole body is telling you, like, we hate it here. We're stressed out. Like, please let us leave. And there's some thought that's like, no, this is what you're supposed to do. This is the only way to be happy, whatever that thought is. And so when I'm saying, I'm 32 years old and I'm going to quit my job and travel around the world for a year, it can be triggering to somebody that's like, that's not what you do. That's not right. That's not because if they accept that my truth can be a truth, then it's like, well, why couldn't it be true for them? Right? Right. Not scary. Yeah. And it's always, I hate to say this, but I always feel like it's family. Like every time it's family members. Like I, man, I don't even tell my family stuff now because they don't get it. Like, like I travel a lot. And so the running gag in my family is, oh, where are you going now? You're always off somewhere. <laughs> You're always going somewhere. You don't ever sit down. And I'm like, sit down for what? <laughs> And so I just know, like, in my mind, I'm taking the rest of this year off um, because I've recently got laid off. And so I think I'm going to just take this year off, the rest of 2018 off, and really try to go find myself. Because what you're saying, it just resonates with me so much. It doesn't make sense to spend your time sitting somewhere, being somewhere, putting energy somewhere into somewhere that isn't putting any energy into you. Right. And it can change. I'll say other thing is like, 
you know, it can be great and like fit a period of your life where you're learning things you need to learn or want to learn or like maybe just making that money and having like, you know, like your health care, but like maybe at some point in your life, that truly is your priority. And there's nothing wrong with that. And like for some people, corporate is fine, but you're allowed to change and evolve. And like, hopefully we all keep like evolving and striving to like get to know ourselves better and to be like living in even better alignment and like just making the world a better place in whatever way is a, is a good authentic way for us to contribute. And so it's okay if you've had a job and for like two years or five years or even 10 years, it fits what you needed. But suddenly if that changes, there's nothing wrong with you. You've just up leveled your life and like your job needs to follow. You know what I mean? So like, mm-hmm. You're allowed to want different things at different points in your life. Like you don't have to commit to one thing and think that if you suddenly want something different, that that you're broken or that there's something wrong with you. That is so key. Like, I think a lot of times we put these expectations on ourselves that we didn't even create, like these societal expectations. And when we either don't want to meet them or can't meet them for whatever reason, then we look at ourselves and think that we're not good enough. Absolutely. That's what we all, I think, inherently, like, knee-jerk reaction come back to, is that we start with, it must be something about me. Yeah. Okay, let's change gears a little bit, because the thing that you are known for is this break. So, and, and how you aggressively saved up money so you could take this break. So, how did you bring that plan together? For yes. yourself. So, yeah. So, so remember that burning truth that was like, I don't know how the heck this is going to happen, but I want it so bad. I'm going to find it. And I'm a great planner. Like, you know, back in my actuarial days, I loved me a good spreadsheet. I was in spreadsheets all day and I love a good plan. So for me, it was like, I'm going to work with the gifts, skills, whatever experiences I have to make a solution. And so for me, it was, I've got to get my money right. Because at the point where I decided I was going to take a break. I had $1,500 in my bank account. I had probably like, I don't even know, like 50 something thousand dollars of student loans. And that was it, right? Like that was it. I didn't have a savings. Like I didn't have an ethic. I didn't have anything. And so it was like, okay, A, how the hell do I make like $90,000, $95,000 a year? And I have $1,500 in my bank account. That's a problem. But number two, how much money do I need and how, how fast can I save it? And so my next step was to figure out how much money do I need? Because if you don't have a really specific goal, good luck to you staying motivated and like staying on track to achieve it. So I needed that number. So I had this amazing time where I just for like two or three weeks started just imagining what would the perfect one year break look like. And so I came up with this plan to do like a three month road trip in the U.S spend time at home with my family for a few months, travel abroad for a few months, and then to come back and like have some time to live in a new city and just figure things out. And so I thought the price tag on that would be $38,000. So once I was like, okay, if I want to travel around the world, take a road trip, do all the things, I need $38,000 and I currently have $1,500. So then I just decided to make a budget. But I didn't just jump in with some crazy, like, unrealistic expectation of, like, I'm going to spend 50 cents a month on groceries and a dollar on eating out. You know, I think a lot of people, like, (laughs) jump to that crazy place when they try to start a budget. But I was like, what the hell am I even doing with my money right now? And so before I even put restrictions on myself, I just tracked what I was spending, like, every penny I was spending over two months. And I was like, where is it all going? Because I can't even really make a change that's going to stick unless I know what's happening. And so what I realized is I was spending insane amounts of money on um, rent, which I think is a big one for all of us. Another Mm -hmm. one was groceries. So as a single person that also ate out, so it wasn't like I just ate at home every day. I was spending $700 a month on groceries. Wow. Right. Gross. Okay. Who does that? I do that. I was impulse shopping the crap out of Whole Foods. Like those cookies are $15 a box. I bet that means they taste good. Let me get one of those. You know, it was just like whatever I wanted, but it was very freeing for me to feel like I could have anything in that store I wanted right. and it aligned with my food value. So I just did it. But when I looked at those numbers, the cool thing was there were some categories of where I was spending my money that I felt really bad about. And that was one of them where I was like, ew, that feels bad. So that's where I started. So really for me, budgeting was 
what am I already doing and what am I doing once I know what I'm doing? What makes me feel bad? I'm going to make it, I'm going to change it. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to make myself feel better about how I'm spending money in these categories. So I started changing some of my habits and I spent way less money on groceries. Like right away, I cut my grocery bill from like 700 a month to like 350 a month um, and reduced how much money I was spending eating out like super fast. Like that was actually an easy lever for me to pull. Some of the other ones took a lot longer, but I just started trying to spend less and have a target for like, okay, I do like to eat out. I'm not going to say no eating out, but what feels like a good number? What feels like a good number for groceries? And I just wanted it to feel good. And so in the beginning, you know, I was only saving like probably like four or $500 a month. And it took me a while to really ramp it up because you have to change habits. But oh my gosh, like once I got in the zone, which was probably honestly about six months to like really like step it up. But once I got in that zone, like there was no stopping me. I just kept saving like more and more money every month. And I was putting all of my lump sum money towards that budget. So that meant like if I got like a big tax refund, if I got a bonus at work, like I had a house that I owned and I got like this escrow refund because my taxes changed. It was like a thousand dollars. Like everything I was not expecting was going directly into that um, savings to like bump it up. And so maybe like a year in, I had, I'm not really sure, probably close to like 27 or 28,000, something like that. And I was like, wow, I'm on track. Like I think in eight more months, because now my budget's under control, I know how much money I'm spending every month. I think I can be done with this and I think I can have my $38,000. So that's when I gave my notice and I was totally on track. And, you know, I made more changes, saved more money. And then when I left in August of 2013, I had $40,000 in my bank account. Wow, that's amazing. The crazy thing is, I know you. Like, you're a small person. Like, $700 a month, what were you eating? Everything, right? Like, I mean, you can go to the store and be like, oh, look at that coconut water keeper. Like, I want that. It's supposed to be great for digestive health. Well, it's like $15 a bottle. And it's like, I don't know, like 16 ounces or something. It's insane. But I was just buying, like, whatever I wanted. I mean, it's really easy to drop a load of money at Whole Foods. It's kind of scary, but I do love Whole Foods, so I still shop there. But yeah, I had to kind of change how I was shopping. Yeah, because that's that's the other thing about the sacrifice of these types of jobs, even though you know you shouldn't. And that whole idea, and I, I think we grew up pretty similarly where, you know, there would be no shopping at Whole Foods for our parents, right? Like, right, right, yeah. <laughs> and so the fact that you can now, you do. And I eat whatever I want. I buy whatever I want. I don't really think about it. I know the fact that I go to Starbucks more than five times a week means that I'm spending way too much money. So, yeah, but it it's so easy to just spend it because it's like, I have it. Right. <laughs> right. And the thing is, is that in some way, I think being in a situation we don't love makes us feel like we've earned those things. And exactly. it's like, we're looking to those things to justify the crap, right? Like I suffered through a bunch of BS this week and my manager was out and like, God, the headaches people were giving me. And like, I deserve X, Y, Z. I deserve that other thing. I deserve whatever I want. Because like I, and it's like, we want these things to make us feel a certain way. And they do for like 10 seconds. But here's the thing, like it's energy. Money is energy. And so if we're living this life, we have to work so hard in a job that we don't love that like secretly is making us really miserable and kind of sad. If we're expending our energy to like make money for that. And then we're spending money on things that actually aren't making us happy or like happy enough or actually giving us these feelings of like, contentment and peace and like true happiness like we're just wasting it you know what I mean like it's not really serving us in the way that we think it is and so what for me it didn't really feel like a sacrifice like it required me to change my habits and Mm -hmm. become aware it's like what I became aware of is the fact that I was just wasting money like I was spending money on stuff that in the moment made me feel good but would I rather have my spicy mocha every day at caribou or would I rather go on a trip around the world would I rather go to like Nordstrom's and be like, those heels are so awesome and I deserve something nice and I can wear them to work so I'll justify it and like they're $200, like I'm going to buy them or I'm going to go out to eat 
and I'm not even going to look at the menu prices because I don't care. And it's like, eventually, we're left with a lot of things in a really nice house with a nice car, and we have a very comfortable life that is eating us up from the inside out. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And we're only doing this because this is what we think we should be doing. Right. I mean, yes, exactly. Like, and we've also been free, right? Like, if you don't, if you want to feel a certain way or something's missing, you've just got to find the right thing to go to, right? Like, I mean, that's, like, marketing is emotions, right? Like, yes. make people feel like they're going to feel a certain way when they buy your thing. And so, like, we're kind of trying to feel like that's how we go find our feelings. But the hard work and meaningful work is, like, looking inside of ourselves and stripping away all of the crap to be like, what really, really makes me happy? And a lot of times it's not all of the stuff. Now I will say, I do still go to Starbucks occasionally and I do still shop at Whole Foods. Like there are things I'm not willing to give up because they make me happy, but I am choosing those things. And let me tell you, each and every one of them, I'm so aware of. And like, they truly bring me some type of joy. And like, there's so much intention. Like when I'm drinking a Starbucks, I'm so aware I'm drinking a Starbucks because it's special. It's not like this automatic habit where it's just part of my day and I don't actually remember that I did it or I do it every day and so it's not special. Like, I spend money on travel. I go, I went to Italy. I've done so many things while saving. I mean, when I was saving for my career break, I went to Portugal. I did Invisalign, which is like crazy expensive. Um, you know, like I traveled domestically a lot. I did a lot of things and spent a lot of money, but I was just really purposeful with like what was special enough to justify taking money away from my break. And some things were special enough, but not everything and not nearly the number of things that before I was tracking what I was spending, I would have like thought were special. Like it wasn't even close, you know? That says a lot. I think we, I think it's a misconception that to budget, to save, you have to just sacrifice to the point of unhappiness. Yes. And that's not yes. true then. It's not. And it's not really about like a lasting budget is not about deprivation. In my mind, it's about prioritization. Like who the hell wants to do everything I've ever wanted all at the same time? Like right now, it's kind of like being that kid that like has way too much money from a young age. And is like, I don't even know how to want to do things. Cause like I haven't, you know what I mean? Like it's good to want things. It's good to achieve things. It's good to have things, but like we don't need to have every single thing all at the same time, right at the same moment. So like prioritize, like, what do you want the most and work towards that? And like, it's not about having less. It's like about focusing more on the things you really want. And like, I will tell you, I put in my budget, um, the special thing called the exploration fund. That's just what I called it. I spent $200 each and every month, like maybe four months in is when I started doing it. Cause I was actually kind of feeling drained from trying to save money. And I felt like my house was like this prison because every time I left the house, I was going to spend a dollar or like $2. And I was like, I got to save all my money. <laughs> then it was like, no one can live like that. Right. right. It's like being on a diet and being like, you can't eat anything except for like green beans or something. It's just yes. like, that's not, it's not sustainable. Right? Uh, it okay. sure ain't. <laughs> yeah. So no thanks. But instead it was like, okay, Katrina, you have $200 each and every month to spend on things that are like, exploratory so it could be learning it could be fun but it has to be something that was new to me and like really interesting so it could be I mean it was like everything like I bought a Vitamix um that was actually two months worth but like because I was way into like making fresh smoothies and like learning about I had a gluten allergy that I just been diagnosed with so like it was about learning how to eat gluten-free in a, like a happy way I took classes I went on a retreat like an overnight retreat um I did like fun activities with my friends I tried new restaurants I like did, I took Spanish classes. Like I just did a lot of random things, buy books, like all kinds of stuff. But it was like this grand experiment in like being really purposeful and intentional about having fun. So instead of just buying shoes or like going out to eat at really fancy places over and over and over again, it was like, I have $200 a month to try to have the most fun and like the most like adventure that I can have. And I was like really purposeful about how I spent that money. And so I wasn't feeling deprived. Because, like, I was spending money doing fun stuff. It was just, like, really intentional fun stuff. That is key, is the intention and getting really super intentional. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like the universe keeps bringing that back to me personally. So hopefully that helps somebody because I think a lot of times we're just going through the motions of life. 
Yes. It's like we need to shake ourselves awake. Like we're on some weird autopilot and it's like you have to shake yourself awake. It's uncomfortable. Like nobody wants to be shaken, but it's like your other option is to just like be on autopilot until you're dead and then go, wow, where did my life go? You know? Yeah, exactly. So now, Katrina, you saved the money. You left Minnesota and you went on your journey and you got to spend time with your family. You went abroad. What all did you do during your, because you took more than a year off, right? Yes. So one of the benefits of being really awesome about how you manage your money and like, again, not living with like deprivation, but just being smart and intentional my money, I realized like four or five months in that my money was not being spent nearly as fast as I thought it would. And so, because I just had these awesome habits. And so my 12-month plan actually turned into 20 months because I decided to just travel until I spent that $38,000. And so it lasted like eight months longer than I expected. That's amazing. That just goes to yeah. show you, we don't need all the things that we think we need. No, we don't. We want them. And it's okay to want things, but we don't need them. And we think that we need them, but we don't. Like, we just need to be living in alignment, right? Like, doing things that make us happy. Like, being fulfilled and excited about your life and, like, helping other people and, like, just, I don't know, being lit up. Like, that really fills you pretty far. And, like, there's a lot of material things that actually don't need to be in that equation for you to feel that way. If, like, the things that you're doing with your time are like making you feel like you're coming alive and living your purpose. So talk, let's talk about coming back after the 20 months. Yeah. Yeah. What was so, that like? Because I know. did you, did you always know you were going to come back and get a job or like, did yeah, you have so, a plan for transitioning out of freedom and back to, <laughs> back to life, back yeah. to reality. <laughs> right? So, yeah, so all good questions. So, for me, there was absolutely a plan to transition because I'm a huge planner. So, I had, like, buffered for several months to basically live somewhere um, that I, I wanted to be and, like, take classes, have time to, like, buy groceries, pay rent, do things and not feel like this immense pressure to find a job in like four days. So that was definitely a plan. However, you know, when I was on my trip, and so for my trip, you know, I did the three months as a road trip. I went home for a few months, and then I traveled abroad for about eight months. Like I went down to Argentina and Colombia, went up to like Western Europe, and then flew over to Southeast Asia for about four months and did a lot of things over there. And so when I was coming back from Southeast Asia, I had – about four months worth of money left. So I knew that I was hitting that transition point where it's time to start thinking about what it is that I wanted to do next. And I will tell you in all honesty, when I started this break, I have a secret hope that like I was going to be sitting on a beach in Thailand or somewhere really cool. And like that voice that told me I needed a break was going to like come back and whisper in my ear and be like, girl, this is your purpose. And just tell me like what it is I'm supposed to do. Or that, like, I would just be walking down the street and, like, find some magical friend that was like, oh, my God, I'm starting a business, and I need someone with your exact background. Do you want to, like, go into it together? Like, I was just so hoping that I was going to get, like, smacked in the face with whatever my next opportunity was, and that I wouldn't have to, like, figure it out on my own, and that I wouldn't have to go back to corporate. Because for me, it was like, if I come back and I don't feel exceptionally sure of what I need to do, I might struggle like with what comes next. And I knew that corporate was a possibility because at this point I still had like $42,000 in student loans for my MBA to pay off. So I knew that was a possibility, but I had the secret hope that I could find another answer, except that I did not find another answer. So I came back and (laughs) basically was like, okay, let's figure this out. And so I spent four months, like, again, taking more classes, like doing community ed stuff, like fun stuff visiting like this nutritional school that taught people how to like become really health and wellness focused nutritionists. Like I just explored a lot of things before I admitted that I was going to go back to corporate. But the reason I decided to go back to corporate is because when the time was getting close and the money was really running out, I was like, okay, I have to make a decision. And what is my biggest priority? Cause it used to be my break. And that was really clear. Like where all my money was going to go was towards my break, but now my break is over. And I was like, what is that thing that I want next. What's my next big challenge? And the answer was 
I wanted to pay off that $42,000 as fast as I possibly could because that was going to be me being debt free. And that was going to be me being like, and being able to embrace freedom. And so for me, I felt like if I wanted to be a life coach or if I wanted to be a, like a nutritional coach, whatever I wanted to do, I could do it in such a free state if I didn't have these like $700 a month payments, like hanging over my head. And so I was like, all right, I guess I'm going back to corporate. And I will tell you, I ugly cried my way through like one or two weeks and like made my boyfriend like just really miserable um, because I was like, I hate this. This is so terrible. Like, why can't I just do what I want to do? This is so awful. My life is terrible. You know what I mean? And right. I'm like, oh my God, get a hold of yourself. Um, but I just didn't want to go back. After almost two years, I didn't want to go back. But so I told myself, I'll find a compromise. I don't need to make $100,000. Like, I don't need it to be a raise over what I had at Mills, but it has to pay well, like, towards my goal of basically like achieving this, you know, no student loan debt, whatever. But I also want to like something about it, like genuinely like something about it and connect to it. And so I started applying for jobs and I was so clear on my goal and I was so clear on like, I'm only going to apply to jobs that I connect to something about them. So I wasn't wasting time on stuff that I didn't like. And so I think having that focus and also being able to genuinely be excited about each and every application I submitted was part of why I was able to land like five job offers in five weeks. So once I really got my resume done and like actually decided I was doing it, the second that my resume was like submitted for the first time and I started down that path, it was about five weeks until I accepted um, a new job. So I was like on it. Wow. How did you explain the gap? Girl, oh my gosh. Can I just say, I feel like so many people think about taking a break or doing something different and they're, and they have this fear of like, well, mm-hmm. how do you explain the gap? And it's like that gap was my badge. Like the way people flash like an FBI badge and just get into a room and like no one asks them any questions. It was like my badge of honor. Like I was like, um, let me tell you about what I've been doing for the last 20 months. I went to Argentina. I learned to speak some Spanish. I mean, I already knew how to speak Spanish, but I practiced my Spanish. Like, I went to Southeast Asia. I got certified to be a yoga instructor. I traveled around the world. I did this thing. Like, it was so interesting and unique, right? And, like, we all know there's a lot of cookie-cutter people out there trying to, like, follow the beaten path and do all the things. And so we all look the same on a resume, and everyone glazes over when they read each other's resumes because they're like, I don't, these words don't make any sense to me. I don't really know what you did. It sounds oppressive, but gross, don't care. And it was like, I was this person that was like all sparkly and did all these things. And so one thing I did, I had a cover letter that explained the gap to address it, but in a super awesome, sexy way, because that's how I felt about it. I was so proud of it. Like I, I did this, like I made this happen and I have the courage to do this thing. Cause it was like what I wanted to do. Right. Like imagine if working for your company was what I really wanted to do. Imagine what I could really like make happen. And so I talked about it in my cover letter. I upsold it. Like, this is the thing. I'm going to tell you why I did it. It's so amazing, whatever. And then I put it on my resume, like in the footnotes at the bottom about like, you know, completed a, you know, a year plus trip around the world, became a certified yoga instructor. And I will tell you again, only applying to jobs where there was some level of connection and genuine, genuine enthusiasm for it. That's what everyone wanted to know about. I can't tell you how many interviews I had were like half to four, like, like 40 to 75% of the interview was tell me about your break. What was your favorite place that you went? What was the coolest thing that you did? Were you scared? Was it fun? Did you like it? Like, did you get home? You know what I mean? It was just like so interesting. And so for me, when I found the right places, that break made me stand out. And like, there was no one else like me in that room. You know what I mean? Yeah. That is, you know, and we do worry about these things because they, they tell us like, well, if you have a gap in your different. resume, don't stand out. Yeah. Yeah. Like or else. yeah. If you, you need to say these things and you need to answer these questions this way and your life needs to go a certain way. But it, what I'm learning from, for myself as I observe the world around me is that people who decide to break the norm find success and success, yeah. how they define it. And a yeah. lot of times success, how society would be impressed like oh absolutely you did what and I think that's key too I know right I think that's key too is like one of the core things I like try to instill with my clients is like we have to be working with your definition of success 
because like literally 99.9% of us, especially here in the U S it's like our definition is wrapped up in our title and the amount of money that we make period and stop. And it's like nowhere in there is there happiness, fulfillment, like, you know, like helping others, whatever, like for some of us, but for most of us, that's not what feels like success because that's what we've been taught. And it's like, if we're working with that as our measure of the successful life, like then we know what you should do. You should just go get the most high paying job you can with like the sexiest title or whatever and just call it a day. But that doesn't really make us happy because that's not for most of us. That's not our internal version of success, like our true version of success. And so to your point, it's like, You've got to be working towards the right person, you know? Yeah. I, my hope for people that they get out of this conversation is that they do try to break out of the mold. Like they, whatever rut they may feel like they're in. And I really feel like the people who are supposed to hear this message are going to get to hear it. And it's going to spark something in them that says, well, if Katrina can do it, then I can do this too. That would be amazing. I mean, I hope I hope for the same thing. And like, I absolutely, of course, 110% agree with you. Like, breaking the norm really means that you are willing to do whatever it was that you were put here to do. It doesn't mean that your path can't be twisty, that you can't change your mind. Like, it's none of that. It just means that you are willing to do things that other people don't understand when you go start down that path or that it's not the path that everybody else took so like you've got to clear the way a little bit for yourself and it's like but man I mean that path that everybody else has gone down a lot of people end up at the end of that path feeling like it was a waste because it didn't lead to the riches and the happiness and the promised land that they were told you know right because you you know I think a lot of times you're chasing after something you see like I always use I love Beyonce and I always use her example I'm, I look like if, when I go to Beyonce concert and I see her dropping on them knees and heels like that. And I'm like, there's no way. Like, I'm glad that she found her purpose and that, you know, I just pray for her knees because (laughs) like she works them hard in in the concert. And I'm just looking at my knees like, man. And a lot of times we look at Beyonce like, oh man, I wish I was Beyonce. Like her life looks amazing. She looks amazing. She has these beautiful kids. She got this superstar rapper husband. Like, (laughs) you know, like it looks like that's what you're supposed to strive for. But nobody ever talks about the work. Right. Well, exactly. Like Beyonce puts in a crap load of work and, you know, like has like fidelity like infidelity issues with her husband and like she gets a lot of like haters and people because she believes in what she believes in and people always like people that aren't at that place want to tear you down but she keeps going because she's doing her thing she's living her purpose yeah but you or i that would not be worth it right because that's not our purpose that's not what we're here to do and so like all of that negative stuff wouldn't be worth it but if you find something that lights you up then it makes it worth it it makes the hard stuff worth it Exactly. And I think that's the key is to look for that thing for yourself. And it it takes work to get there because you talked about it. You did months of work with a life coach. You took a 20 month break. You aggressively saved all this money. You came back. You got another job so you could aggressively save more money to pay off your student loan. So now you paid off your student loan. So what are you up to now? Wow, yeah. that's amazing. I, mean, I know, it's what, that's, I know, man. Having control of your money is like the most empowering thing ever. And again, once you've changed your mindset to it not being about deprivation, it's just like you will use that as a tool to get exactly what you want. So I got my, I got my loans paid off. Like it was amazing. Um, and now it's like I'm about to embark on an even wilder adventure. So I just sold the house that I had owned in Atlanta for 14 years. I've been renting it out for 10. Um, and that was a huge relief. I did not want to be a landlord, but just the market kind of crashed when I went to business school and then yeah. I couldn't sell it. It was just like terrible, but I sold it. And like, that was a huge moment for me. And so I am like 100% debt free. I am, I left my corporate job completely. Um, and I'm now full-time life coaching and um, I am moving out of Minnesota. So, you know, I moved here, you know, with my boyfriend, we've been together for about six years and we decided to, 
um, go our own separate ways. And so, you know, I'm very supportive of him and what he's trying to do, and he's supportive of me, but it just didn't work out that we were doing that together. And so it's like, wow, I'm at this point where I ask myself that question, okay, Katrina, what is that next thing that you really want? And my answer came back, and it was like, I really want to find a new home, and I want to have a crap load of fun doing it, and I want to go on an adventure. So in about five days, I'm embarking on the beginning of an indefinite road trip to travel around the U.S. and visit, like, 15 different places that have at some point in time sounded randomly interesting to go see if I maybe want to live there. And I'm also going to go to a lot of conferences and meet people and events and workshops and do some speaking and, like, connect with people that can help build my community for my inspiration, but also, like, where I can go find my potential clients and help them, like, reclaim their life and take their own break or do their own special unconventional breaking the norm thing. And I'm going to basically document it on my YouTube channel as I go along and try to keep people inspired and just keep showing people like what free can look like, what courage can look like. And like, if they keep practicing being in alignment, making braver choices, even if they're baby choices in the beginning, like what is waiting for them? I'm just inspired. I just really think that you are on it's it's like I feel it like you're on this path to finding like that thing that you were put on this earth to do. And I love that you're helping people do the same. Yeah, I'm like it's it's awesome. And to your point, I don't think I'm at my place yet. Like I think this is part of my journey. And it's magical, so I'm just enjoying it for, like, what it is right now. But, like, I think that there are other places I'm going and other things that I'm going to achieve, like, through this path. And I'm really excited. But I do think that helping other people find the confidence, clarity, and courage to do their thing is, like, part of my mission. Like, I feel so passionately about that. Like, I can't even put it into words. But, like, like, what is life if you're not living it? And, like, so many of us are just afraid. And I don't want people to be afraid. I want to be somebody that inspires them and motivates them to not be afraid. Yes. And and the way you do that is by example. And you are truly a living example of courage. So I'm inspired. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your story. I just really hope people take chances on themselves and not play it safe. I know I'm going to start taking chances on myself and I'm going to stop playing it safe. And I really know that like your mission to help people is so important. And if anyone out there is listening and they're like, you know what? I want to get in touch with Katrina. I want her to be my life coach. I want her to help me transition to where I'm supposed to be in my life journey. Like where can they find you? Yeah. So you can easily find me at um, kmcgeecoaching.com. So um a-M-C-G-H-E-E coaching.com. And um, like I said, I'm starting a YouTube channel to document my journey and check in with people and have hopefully lots of good inspiration and highlight the moments that aren't so amazing, but just showing people how I'm breaking the norm and living my life and sort of what this upcoming adventure looks like up close. Well, Katrina, again, you guys check out Katrina. You can find her at kmcgeecoaching.com. That's K-M-C-G-H-E-E coaching.com. You're truly an inspiration. I wish you all the best. I can't wait to see you when you pass through on this uh, journey, just so I can say I knew you. Because I have a feeling like you're going to be on OWN or something. Like I have this feeling like (laughs) you're going (laughs) to, Oprah's going to find you. (laughs) Okay. Um, I won't, I won't argue that. That would be amazing. Any last thoughts you want to leave with our listeners before we go? I'm just so excited to be a part of your show. And like, I am so thankful that you're doing this. I think there needs to be more of us like asking the tough questions. And so to anybody out there that feels like, gosh, this isn't working, but I don't know what to do about it. Or this isn't working, but it's, it's just me. Something's wrong with me. Like, I just want to let you know, you were put here to like live a life and to live a good life. And I want that for you. Felicia wants that for you. Like, there's no reason that you can't take little steps starting today or tomorrow to get back on the path for the life that is really going to make you happy and really light you up. 
Amen. Thank you for listening to The Trill MBA Show. Please subscribe to The Trill MBA Show in Apple Podcasts. After you subscribe, rate us, i.e. give us five stars, and leave a comment about the show. You can also listen to The Trill MBA Show on Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Radio Public, SoundCloud, or anywhere where you enjoy listening to your podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Trill MBA Show. Please visit our website, trillmba.com, and join our safe space for exclusive content. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week. The Trill MBA Show is a Fair World Corp LLC production, executive produced by Felicia and Rose Anuha. Music is Kick Push by Ryan Little. Keep it trill every day, y'all.